Good day. It's so good to be here with you. And thank you for inviting me into your places and spaces and wherever you are. It is really good. I've been away again. I was away last weekend. It's been a busy and hectic uh, fall, beginning to fall. And I'm hoping that kind of sort of pans out a little bit here. But it's good to be here today as uh, we look at the Word of God, as we get instruction from God through His Spirit. And I pray that uh, you will be blessed and uh, you will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ as we work through some of his uh, pretty awesome word. It's Matthew's gospel that records for us Jesus' wilderness temptations. And it was during this time that Jesus said to Satan, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There, Jesus reaching back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 8, 8 verse 3. Now, someone once said, quote, we're more than just physical beings designed to live off fruits, vegetables, and bread. Someone forgot, and he forgot to put steak in there or something. Anyways, we're also, I digress, we're also spiritual beings, he said, designed to live off every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, it's interesting to note that a recent study in the States revealed, amongst other things, that those who identify as evangelical Christians, 36% of those said they read the Bible every day. Well, you know, stats are just that, stats. Yet this brings up the question, what? What? What are the other 74% of evangelicals doing with their Bibles? And why 36%? Now, Marshall Segal, in one of his articles, puts it this way. The question, quote, why are so many Christians bored with the Bible? Now, you and I it quite conceivably could put together a fairly large list of reasons that might, give a, uh, might be given for this lack of biblical literacy in the church today. Well, someone else said this, though, which is interesting, quote, perhaps Google really has made us stupid and we've lost the ability to concentrate. And or perhaps there are many too, many too many distractions in life. Just think about social media. You know, everybody's on Instagram or Twitter X or Netflix or something like that. And Seagal then suggests another option. Quote, many Christians love the idea of the Bible, but not really the Bible itself. And he points then to those who do love reading the Bible. And this creates an interesting dynamic. Or uh, maybe the, an interesting dynamic isn't the right word. But Seagal, speaking of these Bible-loving Christians, would say this. Their happy discipline convicts, and if you're honest, sometimes annoys you. That is, those who do not love to read their Bibles or do not read their Bibles. So again, back to the question, why are people bored with the Bible? And why do we rele relegate things and say things like this? Some people like to read and some people like to serve. Well, the short answer comes from Seagal himself. And because we have forgotten what the Bible is. And I agree with him. We've forgotten what the Bible is. Please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119. And we'll begin at verse 1 and we'll read together through to verse 8. Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently, all oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes, that I, may, that I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments." I'll praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous decrees. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for those who are listening. Help us, Lord, today uh, enlighten our minds and open our hearts to this text from Psalm 119. 
the longest psalm in the Psalter, and, and a challenge as we begin in these days and weeks ahead to work through this psalm as far as we possibly can go. So help us to do that, Lord, and that it would bring you great glory in the doing of it, the hearing of it, and then the working out of it in our lives day by day. Praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we begin a new sermon series, uh, working our way through Psalm 119. We're, we're calling it uh, The Path uh, to Life. And you might be asking why. Well, in part because of the issue that I brought up earlier in regards to biblical illiteracy in the church. Pastor Albert Moeller rightly put it, quote, the scandal of biblical literacy is our problem. And as a pastor, it is my prayer and hope as we spend some time here over the next weeks prayerfully reading and studying and teaching and preaching through Psalm 119 that our uh, love for God's word would just grow and grow. And secondly, that our love for the Bible would only be overshadowed by an ever-increasing love for God who has given to us his very own word. That we will grow not only in the knowledge of his son Jesus Christ, but also in the grace of Jesus Christ. Now I just want to mention a few features of this psalm, just sort of get those out. And uh, you can refer back to them later for the online folks here. If you have a decent study Bible, maybe like the ESV study Bible or another one like that, you can find out this information for yourself uh, in the future if you maybe forget some of the points I say here. So quickly, uh, some of the features of Psalm 119. Well, the format of Psalm 119 is obviously Hebrew poetry. It's an acrostic poetry. And it's an alphabetic acrostic poetry. I'll let you sort that out on your own. So what's happening here is the first letter in each, uh, of each line in the Hebrew is follows through the Hebrew alphabet. So for example, our eight lines here begins with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And each line in that stanza, these eight verses, if you will, begins with that letter. And there are 22 letters in the Hebrew, so that adds up to 176 verses or 176 lines. Of course, there's themes in psalm, on this psalm, and uh, two that stand out really quickly here. One such theme is the persecution and the affliction of the people of God. We'll see that in, in this text as well and throughout the psalm. Another is the all-sufficiency of the word of God. Psalm 119 also contains within itself eight different terms that refer to scriptures or to the scriptures or to the word of God. And almost every verse all of the of this psalm, this longest psalm in the Psalter, mentions the word of God, except possibly, depending on how you look at it, three or four verses. Uh, the psalmist here also affirms in this uh, psalm the character and dependability of the word of God. And also that God's word reflects the character of God himself. And as we move through this psalm over the weeks ahead, we will encounter attributes of God, such as his righteousness, his faithfulness, and many more. Well, with this, these things in mind, we want to turn our attention to the text. And let's look at verse 1 and 2 together. So verse 1 and 2 present with us what's called a beatitude. Please notice the phrase uh, here, uh, blessed are, beginning in verse 1 and 2. But let's start with verse 1. Why don't you join me in reading that together? Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. I want to break this down into two, so let's notice the, into two parts. Notice the first half of the verse. Blessed are those whose way is blameless. And now we want to ask a question regarding the word blameless. How are we to understand the use of this word? Does the psalmist mean only those who are perfect? Those will be blessed. Those will be happy. Now, we always need to remember that context is king. And keeping that in mind, we should not immediately understand this word blameless in the sense of attaining perfection. If we look at verse 8, we see immediately that this will not 
give us permission to do so. So we understand the word blameless in the context that it is found in. And the word blameless in the original language, which is Hebrew, means completeness, wholeness, soundness. It speaks of a person who has integrity, a person who is sound and whole. Their outer life and reality reflect the quality of the inner life and reality. So the question then is, how does this completeness, this integrity, this way that is blameless come about? How does this happen in this person? And our answer is found in the second half of verse 1. Those who walk in the law of God. So a couple things we need to deal with. Let's deal with the phrase, the law of God. Well, friends, this is the Torah. You probably know this already. Or to the Hebrew, it would be called the law. And the Torah also describes for us the, very, the first division in our Bibles, which is the first five books of the Bible, beginning with Genesis and ending with Deuteronomy. And, but before we move on from here, it really needs to be stated that Christians... Believers, according to the new covenant through Christ, are no longer under the law. Jesus Christ, my friends, has fulfilled all points of the law perfectly for you and me. He even dealt with our disobedience to the law. As the Apostle Paul states so well, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 24. So it was Jesus who took upon himself the punishment of our disobedience of God's holy, good, and righteous law. That's how Paul describes the law. It is holy, good, and righteous. And in our repentance and confession of faith, based on faith alone in Christ, our sins are forgiven and Christ imputes his righteousness to us. Well, with this in mind, this truth, this New Testament, New Covenant truth, does that mean Christians are no longer to obey, for example, the Ten Commandments? Well, some might say so, but the short answer is, of course not. Listen to what the Apostle John said about these kinds of things, which is our commentary on this particular verse. John said, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God, God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 9. And folks, just so you know, the Old Testament saints who were under the law would find provision in that law for confession and restoration. But let's go back to the second half of verse 1. And let's look at the word walk. And it's best understood in the context of our stanza. As the person, whether we're talking about the Old Testament saint, or those under the new covenant that has decided, that person has decided to order their inner and outer lives according to the word of God. These persons are blessed, it says here, of God. Or we could say happy in God. Or better yet, as a psalmist put it, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Psalm 128.1. Well, moving into the second half of this beatitude, verse 2, please read this with me. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Here we encounter one of those eight basic words that I made reference to earlier that describe the word of God, testimonies. And this particular word is used 23 times in this psalm. And this word is related to another word in the Old Testament, a word for witness. So with this in mind, and connecting this word, or this idea of witness with the Hebrew verb translated, those who keep in the SV here, we can say that blessed are those who obey and are loyal to the witness of the word of God. And secondly, because the person is attentive to keep, or to obey the witness of God's word, blessed are those who seek him with their whole heart. Now we go back to our comments just moments ago regarding the law and grace. And I think it should be very obvious to us with just these first two beginning verses of Psalm 119 that we're not encountering rules here for the sake of rules. What we are encountering is God who's expressing his character and nature by his 
written word. We see and we look at this verb translated for us here, seek him. It's tied specifically to the worship of God, who has given us his word. King David said it this way, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. Psalm 40, verse 16. And this phrase, whole heart, refers to a person's whole person, his intellect, their emotion, their desire. Christ put it this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. And moving along now, verse 3 really just ties up, completes the beatitude, where we read, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. This is interesting, because what verse 3, three is doing is restating what was already stated in verse 1. And the psalmist here is true to Hebrew uh, poetry, which is parallelism here, that is restating a previous statement to drive point, home a point. And what is the point? Well, we can go back to the Apostle John for his helpful commentary. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. 1 John 5.18 This is not to say that no one will ever sin again. No. Yet the psalmist would go on to say in verse 10 of Psalm 119, With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. You see, my friends, the desire of the psalmist was to guard his heart and to walk in God's ways. Which then, according to the Bible, God promises to protect the hearts of those who seek him with their whole heart. We go back to John's letter again, where, we, where John said, But he who is born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. 1 John 5.18 So in summation of these first three verses, we can say this. Blessed is the one whose ways are blameless before God. Blessed is the one who obeys the word of God. Blessed is the one who seeks after God with their whole heart. Well, moving along now from verse 4 to 8, we see here in verse 4, the psalmist begins to pray to God. And throughout my uh, Psalm 119, we'll encounter the psalmist praying to God for help, which I hope in turn encourages you and I to do likewise. How wonderful when we look at the scriptures, when we look at this psalm, um, how the writers of the word of God reveal their hearts before God. They're so real and honest and open. There are those in the church today who would say that it's long overdue that we unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. And those who say that and teach that and do that are really doing a great disservice to the body of Christ, my friends. Oh, what the psalmist might say or would say to the 21st century enlightened Christian desiring to discard the word of God. No, the psalmist turns his attention heavenward with a passionate desire to obey God's word for God indeed, as the psalmist proclaims, commanded his precepts. Here we have another word that describes the word of God, precepts. Precepts is used 21 times in this psalm and refers to the specific instructions of God as found in his word. We go to the time of Moses and there in what is often called his last will and testament, uh, Moses restates the commands of God given to Israel through him, through Moses years earlier. And then he said this, You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which which he has commanded to you. Deuteronomy 6.17 My friends, this was the prayer of the psalmist who knew his human weakness and that he was not able to keep and obey the law at every point. So he prayed for the divine power that he would remain steadfast in keeping God's statutes. And there we have this word statutes, another word that describes the word of God. 
And further on in the psalm, it seems that God in some way has an answered the prayer of the psalmist. For the psalmist said, this blessing has fallen on me. I have kept your precepts. Verse 56. Well, let's make this more personal. Can I ask, where have you put your hope in? Or who have you put your hope in? And for those seasoned veterans out there, Christians, believers, hold off on the Sunday school answer, please. Think long and hard to these questions. Just think through the events of the last week of your lives, or even the last 24 hours. You know, someone said, quote, the hope of the godly lies in the Lord. Is this where you have put your hope in, in the Lord? You see, the psalmist submitted himself to God to walk in his ways. Have you submitted yourself to God to walk in his ways, come what may? Not just one hour on Sunday or watching this video or listening to a video of a sermon preached and the occasional Bible study. My friends, the psalmist reveals to us that walking in the way of God is not easy. It requires intentionality. It requires commitment. It requires discipline. It requires what the psalmist said here in verse 6, having our eyes fixed on God's commandments. Here we have another word that describes the word of God, commandments. For my friends, it is the commandments, the precepts, the statutes, the testimonies of God, where one finds life-giving power, where one finds order and security in this life. Even as one commentator, even as the word of God upholds order in the created world itself. Well, not only did the psalmist pray that his way would be resolute and steadfast, but he also prayed that I, he would not be put to shame, verse 6. You know, when we think of shame in our cultural context, in our lives today, we think of that painful and awkward feeling that we have when our consciousness reminds us that we have done something improper or even ridiculous. You know, that uh, red face thing going on. Again, remember, context is king, and, the, and our psalmist lived in another time, in another culture, far removed from our context. And we must never read the Bible according to our cultural cues and tendencies. None of the scriptures should be read that way. For when the Old Testament speaks of shame or disgrace, it is referring to abandonment by God, abandonment by the Lord. Or the condemnation to complete ruin, ruin for the enemies of God. Asaph in his psalm said of the enemies of Israel, let them be put to shame and dismayed forever. Let them perish in disgrace. Psalm 83, 17. You know, if you remembered, we mentioned one of the major themes in Psalm 119, and it was the persecution and affliction of the people of God. And it is, it is in this vein that the psalmist prayed for mercy from God, that he would not experience abandonment from God, like the enemies of God. We also see this reflected in verse 8 at the end of our stanza here, where the psalmist said, Do not utterly forsake me. Well, the psalmist continues in prayer and promises to keep God's statutes, verse 8. He promises to guard the word of God, thereby seeking God's favor, which in turn elicits a response of praise to God with an upright heart, verse 7. An upright heart here, again, is speaking of integrity. The inner, the outer life and reality is reflected from the inner life and reality. And the point can't be missed. We find the response, psalmist's response to the word of God as what? As praise to God. My friends, indeed, one commentator put it so well, quote, scriptures, the scriptures provoke singing and thanksgiving and rejoicing and praise. And isn't that not true? For me, sometimes it seems that I read a piece of scripture, it's like drinking a tall, cool glass of lemonade on a warm day. 
We find this praise of the word of God elsewhere in the psalm. For example, in verse 62, the psalmist said, At midnight I rise to praise you because of your righteous decrees. Well, earlier we stated that the word of God reflects the character and nature of God. Well, notice verse 7 with me. And the phrase, when I learn your righteous decrees. These are the righteous decrees that resulted in the psalmist to give praise to God with a heart of integrity. The first half of Psalm uh, verse 7. But there's a question here, a question that I want to ask you. By what standard does God measure human righteousness? By what standard does he measure your righteousness, my righteousness? Well, short answer again, his word. But you might be saying, Pastor, we are not under the law. And I would say, true. But yet the Bible standard of human righteousness is God's very own perfection in every attribute, in every attitude, in every word, in every behavior. Hence, God's laws, as found in his word, describe God's own character and nature. And these are the laws by which God measures your righteousness and my righteousness. Well, folks, or should I say, Houston, we have a problem. And it's more serious than we think, often think, or believe. For true, perfect, true and perfect righteousness that God measures human righteousness, reflected in his word, cannot be achieved by you or me, ever. Paul puts it this way, no one is righteous, no, not one, Romans 3.10. That's really bad news, folks. Yet in verse 166 of Psalm 119, the psalmist said, I hope for your salvation, O Lord. Well, the good news is, friends, that true righteousness has been granted to the believer, for God made Jesus, who had no sin, sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 You see, my friends, the believer is made righteousness, righteous in the sight of God, accepted right before God, and treated righteous by God based on what Jesus has done on the cross, and nothing else. Nothing else. It was on the Roman cross, my friends, that Jesus, who was holy and pure, was treated as a sinner. And you and me are treated as if we were righteous, even though we are, according to the word of God, depraved. On the cross, that great exchange happened, my friends. Jesus took our sin, and he gave us his righteousness. Blessed is the one whose ways are blameless before God. Blessed is the one who obeys the word of God. Blessed is the one who seeks after God with their whole heart. Let us pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful word of God. Thank you for Psalm 119. And as we have just began to dip our feet into the pool, so to speak, help us to stay steadfast. Help us to guard the word of God in our hearts. Help us to seek after you, O Lord, every day. And we ask this for your glory. Amen. Again, great to be with you. God bless you. Shalom.